Um, yeah, th thanks for the great questions uh, during lunch. I just wanted to, to stress one thing, which is like, in a sense, the kind of boil it all down to a simple proposition to you, which is, <clears throat> as I said, the problem we have in causal inference is that we observe a world without interventions. Or we observe a world with interventions, yeah, but we're not manipulating that world. And we are interested in what-if questions, in healthcare. Yeah, that's fundamentally, how can we change the world for the better? provide new treatments, make recommendations for lifestyle. And so what we have in our, we take the simplest situation, we've got a probabilistic description of the world. X is some pre-treatment covariates. T is the treatment of interest. Yeah, whether people, sh and Y is the outcome. And you have this data here, yeah? So I have the first career on the first individual, what treatment they took, remember that could be a personal choice or the choice of a physician, and then the outcome. And we have N observations in our electronic health records or whatever. Yeah. What we argue is that if you had this data from this world where T was randomized, so a patient came in, you toss a coin, decide which treatment they were put on, and then measured their outcome. If I gave you this data table, you'd be able to read off the causal effect because this side is, the ran is a random experiment. So our hypothesis or proposition is that causal inference at the population scale can be phrased as a missing data problem in a, in a randomized control trial. Okay, now, what can go wrong Suppose there's unmeasured confounders. The red is the thing that you haven't measured, just wasn't captured in the data set that you've got. That happens to be associated with whether you took a particular treatment or not, and also is associated with the outcome. Now, if I, if I ask you to predict in the passive world, yeah, so I've got my observational data, a new individual walks in, X, N plus 1, they have a treatment that perhaps they chose or the physician gave to them, yeah, and I had Y, N plus 1. If I want to make a prediction for Y, N plus 1 using this, I'm okay. I'm okay to take a model which doesn't have U and take it forward, and the reason why that's going to work is because U here, the effect of U is going to get mopped up into the treatment effect, yeah, and maybe into some residuals on Y, but it's not going to affect in some sense the bias in the prediction. So you could still get reasonable prediction here, because the U is getting mopped up into the overall predicted model. So if I don't observe U in this world, it's not such a problem. I can still make accurate predictions. But in this world, it is a problem. And the reason is, is because in this world, it looks like that. Because I ran the right, because I've tossed a coin on treatment, it's now independent of anything else by design. And in this world, when I come to make my prediction at the first individual, I can go badly wrong. Yeah, because I've taken a predictive model which is built from this, and I'm putting it into this. Yeah, and so the, in order to be able to transfer your model, or take the probabilistic model from the observed data and transport it to a probabilistic model for a randomized trial, we're going to have to assume something about you. Yeah, and there's no that makes you feel uncomfortable. It should make you feel uncomfortable. And the questions that we've heard allude to that. Oh, how can we ever know that you, there isn't a you out there? Well, unfortunately, there's no free lunch. Yeah? If, you want to make, if you want to make causal inference from observational data, we're going to need to make assumptions that lie outside of the data. 
And for years, this problem kind of precluded causal analysis from mainstream uh, scientific journals, New England Journal, Lancet. But more recently, there's an appreciation that we can actually migrate between these two. And that appreciation comes from the fact that we can measure a lot more. We get a lot measurements on a lot more individuals. Yeah? And also, because X, we can measure, not only can we capture a lot more individuals, we can measure lots more, we can start to try and mop up <coughs> this unmeasured confounding. Are there any kind of final questions on the principle? Okay. Um, I'm going to pass over to Andrew now. If we can, I'll try and get the, uh, the screen down. In the 23 minutes <laughs> that we have remaining, we're not going to be able to run through the computer practical to get you to kind of simulate an RCT from observational data. But Andrew will talk you through uh, what we're going to suggest we do uh, in that time. Thank you. That's great. Seriously, 23 minutes is not enough. I know you're good. But I Chris said, uh, given the time, I'm not going to kind of run through everything now. Um, and I think for the, these ideas of kind of predictive resampling and kind of predicting this target trial, it's best to kind of um, get your hands a little bit dirty and kind of do some impl implementation yourself to kind of get the idea of what's going on. Um, so what I'll do instead, I'll just kind of give a, a good general overview of what the practical contains. And so in your own time, you can have a go at it. Uh, my email address is here, so if you have any questions about it later, then feel free to email me. Or if you could catch me before uh, this uh, this school ends, then go ahead as well. Um, so yeah, the materials are all on this GitHub page. So this includes the uh, the slides that um, Chris and I have presented. So that includes all all the lecture material, um, and then. <coughs> Yeah, so what we have are three examples. Uh, so yeah, the, the code that I provided is in R, but we're not using any kind of special packages, and the implementations that we're using are, are reasonably simple, right? We're just kind of doing these, uh, um, these for loops basically to do this predictive resampling. So if you wanted to just implement it in your own preferred language, then it's, it's very doable. Um, and so, yeah, so there are kind of three examples. Each one is based on a data set. The first example is based on a randomized experiment. Um, it's uh, a kind of famous data set that was used in economics. Um, the idea was that they had this kind of uh, program that was designed to get disadvantaged male workers into the labor market. And they were just trying to see whether this program was a worthwhile endeavor, whether it had a positive causal effect on improving earnings. Uh, and so the first example was going back to this idea that I mentioned right at the beginning, this idea of um, randomization inference. So we're actually using the randomization like Fisher did uh, to do this kind of exact inference uh, on causal effects. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the idea of this example was that you kind of play around with that, you actually physically do this <coughs> randomization and use that to, to test, your, um, uh, test your inferences. Um, and then for the second example, we use the same data set, so we're still working with a randomized trial. Um, but now we're, we're thinking of the superpopulation idea that Chris mentioned. So instead of just thinking about the sample, we're thinking about uh, a hypothetical population that the sample has been drawn from, 
and we're trying to make inference about that superpopulation. Um, so to do that, we now need to do some modeling. Um, and there's some ideas here uh, related to this uh, method called Bayesian inference. Um, uh, I guess for this example, you don't need to know too much about Bayesian inference. The only thing is that we, uh, in Bayesian inference, we don't just get a point estimate of causal effects in Bayesian inference. We get a whole probability distribution on it. So that captures all our uncertainty uh, about the causal effect of uh, this uh, treatment. And really the, the, the kind of central kind of idea of this example is that we do it in a kind of conventional way uh, and then we do it in this kind of predictive resampling way um, that Chris mentioned earlier where we try and predict the data that we would have liked to have but we don't have. Uh, so you kind of do this analysis in two separate ways and at the end you can compare it and hopefully you see that you're going to get the same thing and you can see what we're getting at in terms of this predictive simulation idea. Um, yeah, so this is just the kind of plot that you should get when you do this predictive resampling and you kind of track the, the value of your parameter. As you kind of impute more and more data, you see that it first starts, the, the value of your parameter starts being very kind of unstable at the beginning, but as you impute more and more data, it kind of stabilizes to a particular point. Uh, and the point that at which you stabilize is actually random. So if you were to do this independent, um, in, independently, you would get multiple different values of um, uh, the value that you stabilize at. Um, and then finally, we, we go on to the kind of idea of predicting this randomized trial using observational data. So this is um, this kind of algorithm that Chris mentioned, where you kind of forward simulate covariates, and then you flip a coin, and then you predict the outcome, and then you keep doing that repeatedly until you get lots of data for a large randomized trial, and then you use that to do inference. Um, so yeah, this study was uh, called the NHANE study. So here we're looking at the causal effect of being physically active on improving your lifespan. Um, and because it's an observational study, there are all kinds of confounders that are involved in the data set that might affect your inference. So um, for example, we might have a graph like this where your age might also might determine your um, how physically active you are, but it also affects how lo um, how long you survive for. And so in that case, you're going to have to adjust for age. And so that's kind of idea of this experiment. So um, yeah, so that's the kind of overview of the examples. If you're not too up for kind of going hands on with with the coding, then um, the solutions are here. So you, if you like, you can kind of read through the solutions that kind of explanations of each of the points and also uh, the solution code is in the same folder. Okay. Um, yeah, are there any questions about that? So, so the exercise are described in the practical PDF, what we need to run? Yeah, yeah, so the, the practical.pdf will have the, the, the questions and the kind of outline of um, okay. what you need to do. And um, it would be a good idea, as also explained in that document, to maybe have a skim read of the papers that are referenced. The papers are in the references folder, um, so just to give you a bit more kind of causal context of, of what you're actually doing. So you're not, you're not just kind of crunching out some numbers, you're, you're trying to do something that is uh, substantively meaningful. Okay. Yeah. Is there any good open source libraries that for doing I mean, the, yeah, so they're frameworks that implement particular methods. Um, so they're algorithms like, uh, you may have heard of like kind of causal forests and things like that. So they'll have methods. But they're, they're very much like, um, so what we've been talking about, what Chris and I have been talking about is about kind of the identification aspect. And that's where you're trying to figure out your causal model. So these packages are where you've already figured out the causal model. And then you're trying to do the estimation. So they have particular algorithms to try and um, estimate a causal effect. So that's like the kind of second part of the two-stage process. Uh, so I think usually I think the packages are going to be of that kind. So there will be packages that kind of implement say random forests or things like um, regression trees and things like that where you try and estimate a causal effect. But then in terms of actually designing your causal model, that's going to be something you have to 
I guess do on your own, I suppose, you kind of figure yeah. it out. Here, the R part is generating the... the yeah, yeah, so, so we... we yeah, we here for the sake of simplicity, we're just looking at very simple, mo like a very simple models to kind of predict the future data. But it's just about getting the um, the gist of what we're doing with predictive resampling, um, and then you can think about maybe more sophisticated models to, to get better performance. Okay. Um, yeah. Are there any questions generally? I suppose um, about anything on the lectures or I, I was going to point out. Um, Yeah. We had some suggestion for future reading. Should I go through? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so here's some references. Um, yeah, so if you wanted to learn more about causal inference, uh, I can think of two quite readable references to, um, to have a look at. One is by Judea Pearl, a kind of popular science type book called the Book of Why. So he um, covers a lot of stuff that we've been, well at least uh, the, the foundation stuff that I talked about. Um, and a lot of kind of yeah, fun examples, historical examples that are very interesting. If you want more of a textbook treatment, I can recommend this book on the right, it's called Inference What If. Uh, so this was written by two epidemiologists, and so it has that kind of angle of looking at things, but they give a fairly balanced overview of the different ways of doing cause inference. So uh, I, I would say these two are quite good um, <coughs> starting points. And the, the What If book is online, so you can it's free, you can just download it. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah the, the textbook is completely free. Um, uh, in terms of papers, uh, so the first paper is by Don Rubin. So this is the guy who came up with the, the Rubin causal model. He didn't call it that, that but like he, uh, he came up with this idea of kind of using potential outcomes for observational data um, and framing um, cause inference as a missing data problem. And then uh, this paper by Holland is uh, where he named this this concept called a uh, fundamental problem of causal inference, which um, uh, we both, Chris and I both mentioned, which is where you have this uh, issue where you never observe more than one potential outcome. And so that's a, that's a fundamental problem. Uh, and then this next paper by Phil David is this idea that you can do causal in inference without counterfactuals, which Chris and I have both found very compelling, um, and has some kind of similar ideas to this to uh, target trial emulation framework that we've been we've been talking about. <coughs> and then very recently there have been uh, a number of interviews with very influential causal <coughs> researchers. So this volume of uh, observational studies um, published last year has interviews with four of the most prominent causal researchers and I'd highly recommend taking a look at that. It's very kind of readable and they outline their way of doing causal inference and they often kind of uh, take shots at the other people uh, for not doing the same thing. So um, it's quite entertaining. It'd be very interesting to get like a panel with all four of them together. Actually, they're probably much, yeah, some fireworks. Okay, so uh, and then the final paper here um, kind of outlines this framework that uh, Chris described, this target trial emulation framework. Um, so you can get more of a uh, kind of more kind of applied perspective on what you do for target trial emulation. Yes. So perhaps in, in terms of lecture notes and exercises, you know, any good resource for that? Uh, yeah. What kind of exercises do you have in mind? Are there kind of particular... Um, similar probably to those, I mean, yeah, with some medical relevance, I guess, but even general ones. I, I think a relatively readable textbook with quite a Quite a few exercises would be um, uh, a textbook written by Don Rubin with, uh, let me write this down. I think 
it's called causal inference with observational data. So Ruben, uh, Imbund is a long-time collaborator with Don Rubin, so he won the Nobel Prize in Economics a few years back. Um, and so, yeah, they, they're very much of this, this kind of idea of causal inference using potential outcomes in the Rubin causal model. Um, uh, another perspective would be Judeo Pearl's big um, he has this kind of classic textbook called Causality. That book's a little bit more technical, I think, but it it goes through his way of uh, doing cause inference quite quite nicely. Um, yeah, I think they have lots of examples in all of them. So I guess from there, maybe you can find something that is kind of quite relevant to what you do and go from there. Um, any other questions? Maybe something to say that um, uh, I'll stand near the mic. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, So maybe something to say that we kind of glossed over, which if you read this paper, you will certainly pick up on, is there's a lot of controversy within the causal <laughs> inference world in itself and I think people say this is one of perhaps the things that has held back on on how to approach the analysis of uh, the causal analysis of observational uh, data and so the approach that Andrew and I have advocated that would follow a mix I guess of the Rubin and Pearl and David is this idea of building probabilistic models yeah, building a probability description for the world and then this idea of saying when can we transport a probability model built from this data to this environment and you have to break some of the assumptions, uh, the dependencies, but that migrates. There is a different approach which says we don't want to build probability models at all, we just want to develop non-parametric estimators. So in other words, we want to go straight for the causal estimate and think about um, estimators that don't build any probabilistic descriptions of the world, but they provide you a, an estimate, a point estimate, and a confidence interval for, say, the average causal effect. Now, we haven't covered that, but you should be aware that that would fall into people like Jamie Robbins, uh, uh, would be kind of advocating uh, that uh, that type of approach. So, just to open the question, I mean, an another thing that you kind of been going to um, is if I want to understand out of many variables that are observed, which are the causal parents of, you know, why do certain people respond and, and what causes, um, which I guess falls into under the causal effect I can try different models, but is it, it's probably more complex than that. Um, yeah, the the kind of identification of the graph itself, yes. uh, which variables to condition on, which ones might be strongly associated with treatment, and all that's an a, that's a uh, an area in its in its own right that of course, just for reasons of time, we didn't have an opportunity. If coming from a Bayesian school it's kind of naturally handled within model uncertainty where you would put a prior probability on edges and potential variables being in, in, the, in this graphical model or not and then you would move from your observational data through to a posterior distribution on that but yeah you should be aware that everything we've said today is kind of hiding the fact that this graph or this the structure of the probabilistic model has already been elicited I'm going to make a comment about that too. So, from what I can understand, it's a question about something called causal discovery, which is like you don't know the graph, but you want to learn the graph from the data. Um, and there are ways of doing that. Uh, there's an approach called invariant causal inference, for example, where you kind of look at a particular causal mechanism, but you do so across lots of different environments and kind of see whether there's certain things that are kind of invariant and those things you can say that gives me an edge on my graph that I can draw. Um, because the kind, you know, the thinking in is I have, you know, medical record and I want to understand, you know, whether some type of drug causes side effects for a totally different mm. drug. Yeah, yeah. So I want to find if 
people that you know take I don't know anti uh, um, you know things for for sh cholesterol to yeah. suffer from something else in case they get yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, this kind of effects which are more than just association but really yeah yeah some yeah. whether it's called or whatever. yeah I guess one one thing I can mention is that when we draw a graph like this. Um, having an arrow here isn't actually saying that much. It's only when we don't have an arrow. That's the kind of informative thing. If we say there's no arrow, there's no causal effect, for sure. But if we have an arrow, it leaves open the possibility that there could be a causal effect or there might be no causal effect. Um, and so I guess to be on the safe side, if you, you, know, you could just kind of have, draw as many arrows as you wanted and then from there see if you can still do inference. If you can't, then you have to start cutting out arrows. But that's yeah, uh, and this runs into a whole bunch of other problems. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. It's not easy, yeah. So, I, I think, thank you again. Right, thanks. Thank you very much. Should I introduce the next speaker? <laughs> no, thank you. Let's see if I can uh, just find how to, how to play along with this. מי? זוהי, את תדעי להגיד לי איך אני... יוצאת, חוזרת מהחלון, סורי. I just want to get into my few slides. So, until Zoe is saving me, I'll tell you the context of what I want to quickly share with you in the next 10 minutes, more or less, and then we go back to the gory details of causal inference and technology that can help you in causal inference. So we'll get back very, very soon to the same... Okay. So I want to share with you something that Vesna here, Vesna, can you raise your hand? Vesna, <laughs> Vesna is a student who, uh, she and I and, and many other, you'll see who, who else, uh, we're working on trying to understand the trend of causal inference. And I'll start with very high level view to give you the context of why we were interested in explainability and causal inference to understand where we are. So two years ago when I was, um, I mean, I still am, but back then I also was a director at IBM Research and I was asked, a question, uh, uh, was asked to a task force. The task force was assembled to um, offer the leadership of the company, the CEO and the um, senior vice presidents, a view on the technology and where it's heading. We do it every year. So every year the uh, research leaders are working together to generate a, a viewpoint and to offer that to the CEO and to the rest of the senior management. And the uh, presentation typically is at the very end of the year but it takes a lot of time to create a, a, a compelling presentation that the CEO would like to spend almost half a day sitting with us and understanding why did we come with this view and what does it mean and so on. So I was uh, recruited to this task force in the mid of 2020 and you all remember that in March 2020 the COVID has started more or less in the, became part of our lives. And of course, the key question was how it's going to change technology. The fact that there's such a pandemic outbreak, is it going to change technology and how is it going to change technology? And what we had in mind is that when you look back at history, big crises like wars and other things always um, change the world in many different ways, but also the industry has changed due to such crises. So if we think about Henry Ford in 1913, offering the assembly line, the mass production approach, he reduced the manufacturing of a car from 12 and, and a half hours to 33 minutes. I don't know how to do a car, but that was what said. 33 minutes it took to make a car when you have this mass production approach of assembly line, moving assembly line. And Unfortunately, the big war or the, war, the first world war uh, um, started and in all of the world there were industries that were rushing to generate all kinds of materials and they immediately adapted that same approach. And in fact, you can think about this war as the, uh, the war that has changed the industry to uh, moving assembly lines to mass production. 
And then if we think about the, the internet, it started in the Cold War. It started at the um, US Defense uh, Department. So this was another accelerator of technology. And the question during 2020 when we were in, in this task force and we had to create a full compelling story of what's going to change and how, we came up into the realization that science is in an accelerated pace these days and in many different ways. So there's the obvious way, which I guess you all experienced. So in the old world, before COVID, BC, when my kids were asking me who is coming for uh, Shabbat dinner, I would say, it's likely 20% these guys, 30% my brother will jump, 50% these, will come, these people will come too. And they were always laughing at me, mom, why are you talking in percentage? Because said, that's reality, I don't know. It was some likelihood. <laughs> but then everybody is talking about likelihood, right? When you talked about the likelihood of getting infected, the likelihood that a vaccine reduces by getting the vaccine and so on and so forth, it became that science-like talks and the understanding of <coughs> the, um, the complexities of science became at different levels but became part of the whole world. And in the industry, if you think about how the industry works, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Inditex? Do you know Inditex? How many of you heard about Zara, Pull and Bear? That's a whole different story. So that's the mothership, the, the um, organization that uh, Zara is a subsidiary of it. And this uh, huge conglomerate, uh, Inditex, is working in a very different way than others. And you can see it in Zara, unlike the fashion, uh, many fashion uh, shops, and don't ask me the names, I don't recall all of them, but they plan for the winter, <coughs> and they plan for the autumn, and they do a lot of months of preparation, and, and so on. And since ever, Zara approach for m many years was, uh, we will do things within six weeks. We come up with a dress idea that we want to create, six weeks we create it, and everything is about experimentation. So if they rent a place, and I talked with leaders in the company to better understand this, it's written in all kinds of places, but if they rent a place in a mall, they rent it in a flexible way so that they can, after a month, increase, decrease, close the place, and everything is very flexible. So they were doing much better than the rest of the market during uh, 2020 of COVID because they are experimenting as their way of living. They always experiment on their clients. So... Um, Experimentation, discovery became part of COVID-19, changed industry in our view, but you know, it will take another 20 years until we can go back and look at it and say that that's indeed what happened. But that's how we, we see uh, what happened there. And for, wait a minute, that's not the right. <laughs> and if we talk about pharma and medical world and our world of this uh, school, as leaders at IBM, we went back to the drawing uh, desk and started to, to ask ourselves, okay, if, if world is changing, what's gonna change in our world of AI? And you can see here a reference where we shared our view in uh, Nature Deal Maker, which is a commercial part of Nature that shares uh, insights on different industries. We showed that our view is that same happens in the in medical and biomedical world, and specifically in pharma, where new molecules will be found in accelerated uh, pace, um, new biomarkers will be found in accelerated pace. And for that, you need AI and cloud computing and potentially also quantum computing. And that was our thesis. And why do I bring it to you today at this very moment? Of course, I had a, the blessing of designing the, the agenda here. So I, I wanted to make sure that I plug it at the right place. And in my view, everything we heard today uh, for, from <laughs> the morning with Professor Dan uh, Turner and later uh, with Professor Chris Holmes and Andrew. Everything we heard is about the importance of causality, how we can apply that, how we can uh, take real world messy data and learn from that. And the hope is that we can learn from that new biomarkers, we can learn about effective, effectiveness of, of drugs and any, any other interventions. So a group of, of researchers, again, it's a European group, so it's a, a, a large uh, um, international group, we asked ourselves as a group, and Vesna was uh, a key part of it, what are the trends in biomedical experimental AI research of today? So this is a study that we finished two months ago. We will submit a paper hopefully very soon. Okay, <laughs> so we submit it hopefully very soon. So please don't share what you see here. I, I mean, you are welcome to think about it, but 
after we a submission we shouldn't publish that so but I did want to share with you what you see at left is the, are the three questions we asked uh, what are the trends is it does COVID-19 play a role we didn't do a causal analysis but some associations we found about COVID-19 and what are future directions and we decided that our uh, field would be our uh, playground would be PubMed so we automatically extracted from PubMed from all 34 million papers in PubMed that talk about biomedical, we extracted 1,600 papers that talk about explainable AI in biomedical, where you, we used concepts like causal and explainable. And we also did some manual review of the titles and the abstracts to make sure that the keywords were not wrong in the way that it was extracted. And indeed, we landed at a smaller group of papers, around 1,300. And then we, uh, we did manual characterization of what type of a paper it is, manual detection of COVID-19 role, and some uh, um, analysis of the trends and conceptual discussion. So that these are the things we did. I will show with you very few highlights as a motivation. Um, these are the different categories we looked at. So we asked ourselves, are there review papers in each paper that we looked at? Is it a review paper? Is it an evaluation or application of, of existing method? Are these data sets or tools that are being offered or discussions of concepts or introduction, uh, introduction of novel methods? And somewhat surprisingly, there are many concept discussion papers. So it's like, I think we saw it today that some of the discussion were more conceptual slash philosophical and some was applicable in how to analyze the data because these things still require some attention. But remember, we talked about biomedical. So our question was not in general, only in the context of biomedical. So we took it from PubMed and the only papers that address biomedical data. And in biomedical, there's this huge debate. Is it real that we can expect that at some point, the algorithms would be so good in explanation that we will trust them because we will understand their level of complexity. So that's one extreme. <coughs> Versus the other extreme that says, Oh no, that's no way, if you want to be very accurate and so on, the algorithm will not explain itself. But you would have to generate tools to trust it, like robustness, uh, testing the biases, all kinds of things that would follow and support the analysis, but will not be at the sense of how the algorithm is being created. So th there's this debate, and I'll keep it open because we have a panel later, so if you want to go back to the debate, we can go in panel. I'll just show you one last thing that I really liked in the analysis. We talked about COVID accelerating discovery as part of COVID and that it changed the pace of different things in the world. We see that also in this data. So what you see at left in the, at the bottom panel, you see the average number of papers on excel explainable AI um, per month. And it's smooth in some way, but it's per month. And what you see, it's the uh, best fit of the curves. And you see that while there's exponential curve, you can see the parameters, there's exponential curve that explains the growth of explainable AI papers in biomedical. Mm -hmm. it, there is a different curve that fits following uh, uh, COVID that fits the, cur the, the, the points on the graph. And the, the, the above panel shows you the fit of curve, how we estimated what's the best uh, uh, fit. And then we did a different analysis. We asked ourselves, if we want to stick to one curve, we need maybe to shift the data. So what happened here, if it happened later, maybe the curve would fit. So we see 18 months of delay. So actually, um, it's 18 months of a jump, right? What should have happened 18 months from now in terms of the natural development of XI, XAI papers happened much earlier, right after COVID. So then back to the realization that COVID might have accelerated discoveries and created much higher need in explainable AI in this context. So I'm, I'm done with this and I'm inviting, uh, so this is the paper that we're about to, to submit and, uh, and the collaborators and I'm inviting uh, uh, Michael Danzinger who is leading activities on causal in, in our IBM research team. Michael, you are welcome to come. He wants you to get into a website, right? Yeah. That's the first step. So thank you very much. If I can use my computer, I prefer because then I can make it all match. Is this a good match? This will work, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I, assume, I assume this will work. Will this work? It worked yesterday. It worked yesterday. Okay. 
So, um, uh, okay, so today I, um, I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful to, uh, to Andrew and to Chris and everyone for giving introduction. Today I'm going to go through a tutorial of uh, the causal lib package. Um, I have it on Google Collab at this uh, shortened URL. Can you uh, make it bigger? Yeah. Bigger, 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 bigger. Bigger. Uh, it's enough. <laughs> it's just those four characters, short URL dot add, little i, big E, big M, big, big X, four. Okay. Um, maybe I'll write it on the board so that I can, uh, I can change here. And so those of you who have a, a Jupyter Lab uh, set up, you can just run it locally, you can download and run it locally, or uh, you can use the, the Collab version, uh, whatever you prefer. Um, no? Okay, I'll go back to it, I'll go back to it. IEMX4. Um, so, while people are getting it set up, I'll just, um, I'll introduce Causalib a little bit. It's a library that we've worked on now for several years. And um, it's it basically tries to uh, it builds on top of sklearn and sklearn uh, interface uh, learners and it tries to mimic that in a causal context to give you like sklearn but in causal inference which is kind of weird but hopefully by the end of this uh, this hour um, that will make some sense. Uh, so can people see? Can I switch now to the? I wrote it over here if if it's missing. So, um, right, so since I'm able to plug in, let me just switch uh, to the other version. So this one, this, I recommend that you just copy it into your account, or, uh, no, forget it, I'll just use the, I'll use the instructor version, so it'll be, uh, it'll just be different. So it won't, it won't change it. Um, okay, is this visible? Maybe I'll make it, I'll do zoom a little bit for visibility. Good. Okay, so um, right. So where to begin? I have to confess this is the first time I'm doing something like this. So uh, please, please be patient and give me feedback at the end. Uh, in order to install Causalib, uh, it's just a simple install in Python. It requires uh, sklearn, um, and uh, we're not going to use any fancy, uh, uh, fancy notebooks, uh, fancy uh, uh, libraries. Just the the standard, um, the standard Python. Libraries. So the first thing that's kind of interesting about uh, about working with with uh, causal inference is that the data looks a little bit different than uh, the regular data that you're used to. Let's say in uh, in sklearn type of uh, applications, right? So you're used to having covariates uh, features if, depending on where you come from and some sort of outcomes, mm -hmm. and uh, you can make a predictive model or descriptive statistics and so on and so forth. Um, now if for for a causal inference, we're interested here. We're really focusing less on the Perl picture, less on the causal graphs and discovery and so on and so forth. We're really focused. The causal lib is really focused on predicting the outcome of interventions. That's what we're interested in. And so we 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 need the the to look at the covariates, the features and the outcomes, but also at the treatment assignments. Okay, that's the that's the key thing, and we we store that in a vector. Uh, that the convention in the library is to use a vector a for treatment assignments. Okay, so the data that I'm going to use today uh, is uh, based on the uh, ACIC challenge from uh, 2016. It's packaged uh, within Causalib. This is synthetic data, um, which was generated in order to try and fool causal uh, inference algorithms, um, and to see who could uh, who could overcome the the challenges. Um, so looking at it, we, we, the convention is, is that the number one in treatment assignment refers to the treated and zero is the control. So we're looking at a population of 4,802 individuals 
858 were under intervention, 3944 were under control, uh, and then they had some outcomes. Now, in this, because this is synthetic data, these these numbers, uh, the outcomes have no meaning. Uh, it's just it's just generated. Um, generally speaking, you're going to be looking at whatever the the thing of interest is. So before we even get started, it can be kind of interesting to look. You know, we've talked a lot about relations between data. Um, with, uh, with the treatment assignment and also with the, uh, uh, the outcomes. So do we even have any type of correlations in this data? Like if we, if we would not find any correlations, we'd find very low correlations between treatment assignment and, and, and outcome, we might think that maybe we're just barking up the wrong tree and so this, this data is already randomized or maybe there's no effect. So what do we see here? What are the vexes? Are these, are the, these are the fake features that the data is generated with. Okay. These are just, they're there in order to trip you up. How many features are there? Uh, 79 features in this case. 79 features, one, uh, one uh, continuously vary, uh, varied outcome. And now the question is, is we want, to, we want to do an effect estimation. We want to know what is the, what is the effect of the intervention. Uh, namely, what is the difference in the potential outcomes among those who have, for each individual, had the individual received the intervention versus that same individual had they not received the intervention, right? We want to enter this universe in which the both paths are open before us, the intervened upon and the not intervened upon are both there, and we can estimate, based on that, the effect of the intervention. So without causal inference, I think what everybody, if you were just, even with causal inference, the first thing you would do is just look at, well, what's the difference in the, before I even start with the analysis, Right, what's the average effect for those with the intervention and those without the intervention, like before we get all confused. Um, so we see that the average value for those under intervention was seven and those without intervention is three point four four. Okay. But, but there's no meaning to it, right? No, this is just yeah. This is in 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 a real life situation this would be uh, yeah, this would be the uh, the we, we like to look at weight loss as a classic example, the smoking and weight loss study. This could be the weight of the treatment group after stopping smoking versus the weight of the group that was not treated, i.e. that did not stop smoking. But in our case, it's just, it's just a number. Okay, so that gives an average effect of 3.58. Uh, <coughs> uh, okay, and we can see that there's, uh, we can see when we look at the effects also, we can, uh, this is also kind of a, you know, straightforward. Before we even get started with causal inference, okay, we have two distributions. We see the treated distribution is clearly shifted with respect to the uh, untreated distribution. All signs are pointing to some, some sort of a positive uh, effect uh, of the intervention on the value of the outcome variable. Okay, so so far we haven't even touched causal lib. This is just getting to know a certain data set that has this type of structure that we would like to find in a data set in order to do causal inference. We have covariates, we have treatment assignments, we have outcomes. Now we want to know what, what, it, what are the effects. So causal lib is a little bit different. This kind of relates to the, the questions that came before about the tools. Uh, when it comes to, to, to modeling, causal lib, according to the docs, implements meta-algorithms, right, that allow plugging in arbitrarily complex machine learning models. What that means is that causal lib is not Im implementing any regressors or any predictors or anything like that. Causal lib is basically a framework to take those models that have been implemented using the sklearn interface and to integrate them with causal data to give uh, causal estimates. So what I'm going to show you today is how to take some standard sklearn models to plug them in to the, to the causal lib uh, kind of machinery and see how, the, how it handles uh, this problem of uh, causal effect estimation. Okay, so we'll begin with the, um, a very a simple class of models, uh, kind of limited but, but very, uh, still very attractive. Uh, called the, the weight models, and the, the, most, uh, the most popular one, the uh, inverse propensity weighting. Just, I'm curious how people, how many people have heard of inverse propensity weighting in this, in this audience? We have a minority. Okay, inverse propensity weighting, I'm not going to explain uh, why it works, uh, and uh, uh, the, the basic assumption of inverse propensity weighting is that you, it, by reweighting the population, with the, the inverse of their propensity, namely their probability to receive the treatment, um, the, the population estimate is then corrected for the confounding of the treatment assignment. 
Okay, so to understand it better, you can those the the resources that that Andrew and Chris put up are are excellent, especially uh, Hernan's book. He has excellent explanation of the theory. Um, to for now, just to, just take my word for it that it's that it, that it's a real thing. Um, and so from for for causal lib, causal lib has an IPW causal estimator, which takes as an argument a learner. So because this is a because this is a propensity model. This learner has to be something that can. That's really a. It's really what we would call a probability regressor. It's a prediction model, but we're not really interested in the prediction. We're, is to, we're, we're interested in estimating the probability uh, of of being assigned to the treatment group. Okay. So we the 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 syntax for for causal lib, and this is where it gets a little bit a little bit different from what you're used to from sklearn. Uh, we don't have one or two uh, uh, arguments for fit, we have three, because essentially all of these causal questions integrate the covariates, the treatment assignment, uh, and the outcomes. Okay, so based on that we have some numbers. All right, bear with me here. We have, we, we, at this point we have no idea whether these numbers are good numbers or bad numbers. They're a little different than we started with, uh, but uh, that, would be the, that would be the population estimate of IPW. Um, so the, the first thing that we're going to look at is the evaluation. Okay, we've done this. Is it any good? Should we, should we believe this? Is this, you know, uh, like what, what do we do? What do we do with this? So uh, one of the things that, that Causalib has built in is a nice uh, cross-validation uh, evaluation uh, unit. It's going a little bit more slowly now because it's doing a, a five-fold cross-validation and because uh, Google Collab cheaps out on the cloud resources. Um, so what it's now done is we've now fit five models. We've now done train, train test splits on the, on the original data and fit uh, five models. Now, um, once we've done that, once we've done that evaluation, we can start to look at some of the, um, some of the sort of the classic uh, evaluation metrics. So this figure on the left is the propensity distribution. This is kind of a convention to, to draw it in this way, up and down where the, the propensity is this, this value that we're trying to uh, predict, uh, namely the probability of receiving treatment. And we would expect that it would be skewed to the left for the untreated group and skewed to the right for the treated group. Uh, however, we also want them to be overlapping. We see here that they're not really overlapping very much over here. In a, in a more realistic question, we might return to the data now and say, is it even valid? Do we have a positivity violation uh, in this case? Um, the, the, the other uh, interesting plot that we have here is the balancing, right? So as, uh, as I think uh, uh, Chris mentioned uh, earlier, and I think as uh, Isaac's question, a, a lot of the causal methods ultimately come to a question of balancing, some sort of matching. You're matching one population against the other population on the individual level, on a, through weighting on a population level, and one of the metrics that you look at is the uh, the absolute standard mean difference, namely how different are the features, are the averages of the features after you've matched or after you've uh, after you've reweighted, right? So what that uh, what you would want to see actually what you want to see is something like this that the unweighted differences, right? The unweighted difference means that you could have right I have unweighted difference here of 0 0.8 for example. What that means is that prior to weighting. Uh, prior to prior to waiting, one of the populations had uh, eighty percent. Uh, we're not eighty percent. This standard average mean difference. How do you how do you translate those uh, those words? It becomes a little bit tricky because it's in it's in uh, it's in uh, it's, a, it's like a it's like a z score because it's a, it's a standardized mean difference. The standardized mean difference between the value in one group and the other is uh, zero point eight. Uh, which is which we would say is quite high. We we like to have it around zero point one. So we see that after waiting, all of these numbers are low. This is a variant of the love plot. I don't know if you've seen the love plot. We also have a love plot here if you want to see it in the classic way. These can be very informative. And this is one of the reasons that we like weight models because for real variables, here it's a bit of a mess, which is why I showed the scatter. You can see the amount of difference in the population before <coughs> and after waiting. So this, this is a good looking figure for waiting. And this would make us think that we're heading in the right direction. Um, of course, it can't be that easy, otherwise I would just end right now. Um, uh, we also have built in some of the precision, the, the precision, the recall uh, of, these, of, of, the, of the probability 
uh, model, namely of the propensity model. So those are also available out of the box. Now, where, it kind of, where we start to get a sense that we maybe messed up a little bit here and did not really solve the problem is when we look at the calibration curve. Because at the end of the day, we're interested in, in, in regressing the probability and getting a good metric of the probability. All right, so what we find when we do that is that the calibration is actually, <laughs> it's actually totally off. Um, right, we, we, this, is, this is hard data. I think if you would take, we, I would encourage you to try this on the standard data like NHEFS that hasn't been engineered to mess you up. Um, and you'll see that the calibration will be a little bit nicer. But I think this, we're seeing, we're seeing some of the limitations uh, of this approach. This is a logistic regression. It's a very weak model, comparatively speaking, though robust to overfitting. So uh, the, what I would, I guess, if people have, have energy for it, I would ask you now to look at this. I think in the version that you have, this cell is, uh, is empty. Um, and um, so you can give it a try yourself and see what happens if instead of using logistic regression as a wave model, you use something maybe a little bit more, uh, a little more powerful, like I chose the gradient boosting classifier, but um, any, you could try any, um, uh, any any classifier that outputs uh, predict prob a any out, out, that, that that outputs a uh, a, uh, a probability estimate. Um, so I don't know if anybody actually wants to try and do this, but you can you can do it and see what happens in on your own computers, or you can just uh, 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 come along and see how um, how it, how it comes out on on mine. Um, so, I'll I'll preface this by saying the weight these weight the IPW model, no matter which weight model you use, is always going to have a limitation of um, not being able to make individual level predictions, only population level predictions. So now here we see that at least on the f on the face of it, this is actually doing much much worse here. Um, this, uh, the propensity distribution, here we have a telltale sign of what looks like a uh, positivity violation, right? And this is a, a kind of a subtle point, which I'll, I'll say now, and maybe we can discuss uh, uh, at greater length later, you don't want a perfect propensity model, right? As a predictor of treatment assignment, if your propensity model is perfect, then you have a problem with your data. That means there's something in your data that from which you can conclude with 100% certainty that one of the patients is going to receive the treatment or not receive the treatment, which breaks the positivity assumption. So according to this model over here, the other model did not pick up on that. According to this model, there are some conditions that uh, identify one uh, set of, of, uh, of, of patients as being ineligible for treatment, effectively, is what this, uh, what this tells us. So once again, in a real situation, we would go back and understand these patients. We would try and uh, redefine our inclusion criteria understand why we ended up with, with this group. Because this is synthetic data that has been guaranteed to be, that we are forced basically to make an assumption, uh, uh, an estimate on everyone, we're going to continue. Um, if you look here, the calibration is actually a little bit better in this case. Um, this is doing still not great, but a little bit better. Okay, so um, we have some prediction scores. I don't think I'm going to dwell on the prediction scores uh, very much. At this point, uh, I will just comment in passing that the performance of the logistic regression varies dramatically with these numbers um, if you change it to class balanced or not class balanced. Um, it gets better at the prediction, but worse at the calibration when you use the class balancing. Okay, so at this point, you know, if, if for some reason you were sticking with weight models, right, you, you really wanted to use weight models, you might say, okay, I'm going to now drill down, I'm going to try some sort of feature augmentation. Uh, try and understand why some of these models are working or not working. Maybe use uh, some sort of ensembles. Okay, that's that's that. All of that can be done. Basically, you would, if with Causalib, you would kind of work with the models on one side, and then uh, it's sort of a SK learn pipeline, and then use the the tools here to get the uh, the the estimates and the evaluations. Uh, for now, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of change gears a little bit and look at the outcome models. Wait, wait, yes. Any questions before we move to outcome models? Yes. Uh, does the package also support uh, non-binary treatment assignments, like multiple treatments? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for some of the models, it might. I mean, for something like uh, for something like propensity weighting, I don't know of a method with multiple treatment. I don't. It's not supported. Well, okay, right? oh, of course, you can always do one versus all. Yeah, you can set up one versus all. Um, in general, a lot of it becomes. You have to be careful when you have multiple treatment assignments. What exactly the definite? What effects? What effect are you looking at becomes a more complex question. So most of that, I don't think we have support for that in general. Um, any other questions? Okay, so let's look at outcome models. Um, so I would say, like, sort of the the, the short conclusion with the, with the weight models is that they're sort of working, but something something appears to be missing, and we'll see at the end um, that maybe weight models are not the right approach for this for this problem. Um, okay, so with the outcome models, the simplest outcome model is just basically, you know, you just do some sort of a linear, linear regression where the treatment is one of the variables. That's the simplest standardization model, and under the right assumptions, you could attribute a sort of causal interpretation to that. We're going to go one step further here and do what we call stratified standardization, or T-learner. This is a very straightforward uh, outcome modeling where you effectively train one model for the treated group and one model for the uh, control group. So you and and for to to predict the counterfactuals, to predict the potential the potential outcomes, you then put all of the samples through each of the models, right? So, <coughs> um, and in, in so doing, you're you're in a very, uh, I would say, direct way, estimating, based on all of the information you have, estimating the effect of the treatment. Um, on the uh, uh, on the treated and on the uh, and on the control group. Okay, so here too we can begin with a very simple model with uh, with linear regression. Um, right, always I would I would always recommend starting with the simplest. Uh, see what see if you see if you even need to go further. And I think here you'll see this shouldn't be too hard to see that this the simplest one leaves something to be desired. Okay, so again, we have the same syntax as before. We have an evaluate function where we can evaluate with uh, cross-validation on the data. And because we're now looking at an outcome model, we're not going to look at weight metrics. We're not, those, those things are not going to be uh, of any value to us. Um, instead, we're going to look at the, at the residuals. Okay? Okay, is this visible? So um, this is an interesting case because it's uh, pretty bad, uh, actually. Um, it's not awful. It's not awful, but it's it's clearly missing something. Uh, specifically, um, you could see for the the uh, the higher predicted values are uh, are are negatively correlated. They're wrong. Uh, and furthermore, you can see that for the treated, the pre the predictions are pretty okay, uh, but for the control group, the predictions are way off. And so we have here that's something that's kind of problematic on a, from a non-causal perspective and also from a causal perspective, namely that somehow we're able to learn something about one of the treatment arms that we're not learning about the other treatment arm. Right? So this is telling us that this is model is not performing uh, as well as we would like. Um, so similarly, we have uh, you know, conventional uh, metrics over here, which more or less tell the same story. Um, you know, the MSE for the treated is, let's say, tolerable, while uh, for the control is substantially higher. Um, and uh, the actual means, you know, on all of the, 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 the real data that we have, the treated on the treated, and the control on the control. It's just sort of a weighted average of the two. Okay, so last time we tried using a, a gradient boosting system, and it got a little better. Let's see what happens when we use a gradient boosting train uh, uh, method over here. So this also I left blank in the in the version that I sent in case you want to type it through. Uh, here too, the syntax while we're so we have a couple, of, we have a little bit of time for while it, while it computes. The syntax again we have sort of the causal the causal lib model, uh, stratified standardization, um, and it takes as an argument the uh, SK learn model, right? So it's very very it's very straightforward to check the the effect of, of different model decisions, different hyperparameters um, on the uh, on the causal uh, <laughs> estimates. Okay, so this is already this is already looking much better when we look at the residuals over here, right? 
and now we no longer see deviations we no longer see uh, you know big uh, big differences also look at if you look at the MSC here across the board it's much much lower so I think here we can say with much more confidence compared to the last case that the um, the, the gradient boosting is working um, the outcome model is uh, is doing a pretty good job uh, at this point so once again we still don't know the, the essential causal question of do we now know the truth about what would have happened to each each sample had they undergone the other treatment we still don't know that but we can say that our model is uh, has converged uh, in a way that the the, the linear model uh, clearly did not so um, the, the final category that I'd like to show is uh, doubly robust models. Uh, w robust models are, uh, is, is, a, is a, very interesting, uh, a very interesting phenomena. There's a whole family of models which incorporate a treatment assignment prediction and also a outcome prediction. It incorporates both of these, these parts of the, the, the process. And they have this very, uh, this very valuable property that the, that the model variance is the product of the variance of the, of the propensity and the outcome models. Uh, namely, if what's important is that if either one of them goes to zero, then the total variance goes to zero. So basically what it means is you have two chances to get it right. If the propensity model is right or if the outcome model is right, the predictions will be, um, will be uh, valid. Uh, estimates. So these are, I think, most of the time, unless compute is a problem, I think the good advice in general would be to use the the W the, the W robust models. Um, so one <coughs> there's a, there's a whole bunch of models that have this property. The one that we're going to look at here is called TMLE. Uh, there's a link here to the paper uh, about it, and also to an example notebook explaining better what what the uh, the the logic of this particular method is. Uh, suffice it to say. Uh, the, like all of the W robust models, it now incorporates two models, and now these models are actually the causal lib models themselves. The weight model is not a SK learner. This is the the uh, the IPW, um, and the outcome model is the uh, standardization model. Okay, so in this case, as before, we can. Um, uh, we can the, the the syntax is still the same. You fit with x a and y, and the, we can in, we can estimate. Oh, I'm sorry, I neglected to mention this with the outcome models. We now have another function available to us, which is to estimate the individual outcome. So for outcome models and for the W robust models, you can also out estimate the individual outcome and not just the uh, not just the population outcome, uh, which we'll see. Uh, in a second, why that can be uh, kind of important. Okay, so uh, now that th because this model has two submodels, we can sort of we can uh, we can put together uh, each of the um, each of the variants that we've seen so far. We could have a linear IPW and linear standardization, uh, gradient boosting IPW, gradient boosting standardization. Uh, linear IPW and gradient boosting standardization. All of the options we can we can uh, test. And looking at the population estimate, it's hard to see too much. I'll show you in just a second comparing all of the different population estimates. Um, what what comes out? So okay. So at this point, so before I move on to the to the conclusion, I'll just sort of sort of repeat. So what we what we've seen here is we have the ability to kind of latch on top of these, these uh, the, the familiar um, SKLearn models and to, inv to basically to sort of repurpose them for, the per for, for, for potential outcome estimation along with evaluations of those potential outcomes or those not necessarily potential outcomes themselves, evaluations of the typically of the models in ways that are relevant for understanding um, whether they are working because the, the, the thinking here with the evaluation is that even though you cannot know whether you have you know successfully predicted what would have happened to the individual each individual had they received the, the intervention other than the one they received what you can tell is whether those models that are trying to estimate the components of that are working correctly 
uh, in, and that's what the evaluation package is, uh, is, has provided us. And it's kind of pointing us in the direction of uh, standardization here. So now, this data is special. The reason that I chose it is because it's, it's the special data. It's synthetic data that has ground truth potential outcomes, something that you'll never find in, in real data. But um, in this case, it has ground truth uh, p potential outcomes. Um, oh, right, sorry, it's because they have this. Uh, one second, I didn't, I just have to uh, change to uh, old Python here, because I guess Google doesn't give you a new Python. Um, OK, so now we've done a whole bunch of, a whole, we've used a whole, a whole kind of, how many is that? One, two, three. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different uh, causal models based on linear and gradient boosting approaches to estimate the mean outcome under treatment. So the, the marginal, uh, the marginal uh, estimate means the estimate with no causal corrections at all. So we see that all of the causal corrections, specifically for the treated group, are, uh, tend to reduce the number compared to the marginal. Uh, with the control group, they seem to increase it by a certain amount. Okay, so overall reducing the, the overall size of the effect. Um, and uh, yeah, it's interesting that we see that with the, the, the treated group, I'm sorry, the, the, the control group, there seems to be more agreement about what the effect is across the board. But now we, we're kind of, we can turn to a question that we've kind of avoided until now, which is the question of the individual effect. Um, is the is the effect the same for all individuals? You know, so many of these models tacitly assume that the effect is the same, that there is such a number, the V effect, and if only we could discover it, we would know the truth of this causal question. Um, so what we find here is actually something rather surprising until you know that this was data that was generated in order to screw up your causal methods. Um, so the ground truth individual effect, if we look at the difference between uh, the potential outcome of being intervened upon and not being intervened upon, it's actually bimodal, right? So for a the, for the majority of uh, for the for the majority of um, of samples, the intervention had a positive effect on the outcome. Uh, however, there is a sizable minority here for whom the intervention reduced the values of the outcome variable, right? You could think of something that, an intervention that actively helps most people and actively harms another set of people. So what is the effect of such an intervention? Um, so the weight models are categorically incapable of discovering such a pattern in the data because they, are not, they, they do not generate individual uh, effect estimates. Uh, however, when we look at the uh, the standardization and the uh, the TMLE models, they actually uh, they do make this estimate, and it's uh, it's actually quite interesting. We could compare here the standardization and the TMLE models. We see that the linear standardization is this is what we saw before in the uh, uh, in the in the residuals uh, doesn't quite it, it gets it gets thrown off for some reason here. I guess we could, we could drill down and <coughs> understand better. Um, the gradient boosting outcome models seem to do a very good job. And the TMLE, the, the W robust version, uh, makes it slightly better. We'll see in a second what that uh, slightly better uh, means. But uh, interestingly, the, the big story of the data, or of the, of the ground truth effect, namely that it's positive for some and negative for others, was correctly discovered uh, using the more sophisticated models. Um, now, just kind of maybe as like a, as a postscript, the, the score that was used in this competition, if I understand, if I remember correctly, is, the, is just the mean squared error, like an L2 norm on the individual effect. So we can now compare um, all the different methods and see which had the best uh, ground truth or wh which had the best uh, L2 norm, the, 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 the lowest uh, mean squared error. And indeed, we see that the, uh, that the gradient boosting TMLE method um, is, is the best um, by, a, by a kind of a small margin compared to, to, the, uh, 
to the other. As, as long as gradient boosting is part of the standard, is part of the outcome model, it does quite well. If not, it doesn't do so well. Um, though TMLE is uh, strictly better than the non-TMLE version uh, across the board. So the, the doubly robust uh, works uh, as, as expected uh, across the board. Uh, so I don't know if this is too short or too long, but this is, this is more or less what I have to share, and I'd be happy to discuss it further. If anybody has any questions or any, uh, any comments, I think that this is available here. If you go to, uh, if you go to our GitHub, uh, you will find um, a large number of examples. Uh, so all these things that I talked about here as one-off things, there's sort of dedicated notebooks to each one of these uh, models and a few sample data sets sort of working through um, the different functionalities, how to use it. Um, so I would encourage you to check that out. But um, yeah, any questions? Yeah? Yeah. Because it's a simple model worked well enough for one class. Yeah, that's an interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting suggestion. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I'm, yeah, you can you can do that. I don't remember what the syntax is, but yeah, you can do that for sure. Like it's a, it doesn't break the theory of the two how it works to have different models. Like no, no, I don't. No, I don't. I don't see why it would. No, because the because I think what Andrew's comment earlier is I think very very instructive here that like we're looking at this. We're looking at the estimators in terms of we're, we're we're trying to generate the estimates of the causal uh, whatever it is the effects right so which are model independent you need a a prediction model which model it is the the theory is uh, broadly speaking um, yeah not sensitive yeah so I was wanting to ask about the how you do the individual. No, if I recall correctly, it's the 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 estimate has is is on the model. It's it's the the model outcome where we, the, we don't use for these learners anyway. We don't use the actual uh, observed outcome. We use the prediction from the model. Okay, so even if you the observe the outcome, you still use the prediction. The prediction. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. So that's the I th my understanding is that's the that's the the, the valid estimate. Um, but yeah. I guess if we have time, I could go through. I could run the whole notebook again using much more friendly data and see uh, how it uh, okay. see how it comes out. Can so, you, can you just clarify a bit better how you assess the whole pipeline? Because you have a lot of different uh, approaches of predicting both outcome and the causal effect, but then at the end we saw different estimations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the the brain and testing of like you know the the actual prediction outcome and you says on one group of intervene intervention zero and then you predict on the other group, right? Yeah. So you don't have to Um 
Okay, I think if I understand your question, um, in, in general, we don't have the same because the problem is not like a predictive, a standard predictive problem, right? Where we where we where we know what it is that we want to predict. We have these are the these are the x, these are the y. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna predict it. We don't have that. Uh, instead, we kind of we kind of piece it together. I mean, there's not there there isn't a single metric. I guess that's 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 what I'm saying. Well, this metric is this is a ground truth metric. This is this is the this this is a if you get a good score on this metric, then you built a good causal model. So that's on a test set with their GP where you give the predictions that are not available to you, and then you get a feedback. Um. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, you, you want to know how it's managed conceptually? Yeah, that's how it's managed. But this is a this is kind of misleading. I mean. Because real real situations, you Don't never this. see this. You never have this. Yeah. But how how did you get these scores? Because for the test data, they give you the potential outcomes. Okay. I mean, they, they, so they, they give you the. You not to touch the test data when you play so you want to know how they manage the competition? I don't know how they manage the competition specifically, but. Uh, Usually, yeah. how they have like public and private? Yeah, yeah. So some some variant of that, where they'll give you a some set of them where you can train on, and then. So this is like the public test. Yeah, yeah. I could have I could have just forgotten everything about causal inference and just done taken the ground truth prediction pr potential outcomes and just uh, drawn a model to train on that, but that would have been uh, kind of stupid because it's, <laughs> it's you know if you do that then it, it's there's no causal inference if you have access to the ground truth uh, potential outcomes uh, to train on. So my question is again, yeah. if you don't have this in the real world, yeah. So you would use these other metrics that I showed. You would so use. You don't have this distribution, and you have this, and then I look at this graph and I see a lot of colors, but I have no indication to what color. Well, no. So I mean, one thing that you can see is that they've more or less converged on the population estimates. Right. But if I, if it's important to understand what the uh, that gap is, right, or the effect is. Right. Okay. So now, so that's so. Uh, I think some of the stuff that, that, that Andrew started to, to, to discuss is goes into that direction in terms of the confidence, your, your confidence interval. If you could do a bootstrap on it, can you see is this, uh, is this uh, compared to, let's say, null treatment assignment, right? Uh, that's like a, a sort of p-value. Is the, um, uh, if, I were to, if I was to assess the effect on a randomized uh, treatment assignment, what effect would I get? That can, you could build a distribution. Uh, of uh, of effects on, on on the null, basically permutations of the null, uh, and to see how unlikely your effect is, uh, sort of error statistic type of approaches. Um, that's I would say the next level. The first level is are the models working? So the the main focus of the the, the packages, the, the the evaluations, the tools that Kozlov is supplying is the first level. Are my models working correctly as components in a causal estimate? Right, and so we can see from that in certain cases, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. If you see no, it's not working, so now you need to stop and either choose a different model. Right. Right. But if everything's working. When you have two different distributions of, you know, intervention and non-intervention groups, and when you predict the outcome in the intervention group, the non-intervention group, you can't say if those models transfer well enough. Not okay, so that's so that's related to the question of positivity and to, to the what we see uh, we saw here we touched upon it a little bit here with the propensity modeling right so this is this is kind of a red flag um, in if, if this is if this is really the case um, right so maybe I'll show the, the, the other one is a little more friendly um, if you if you can detect something in your data that says this the treatment group and the control group are too different Right? There's I from the covariance of the treatment, I know that they never would have been in control. And from the covariance of the control, I know that they never would have been in your treatment. Then the positivity violation is you, your positivity assumption has been violated and you need to stop. Right? That's kind of the now usually what you do is you trim what we what we would do in practice. If you have an observational data set, you now have to redefine your your, your study. Um, because if you would 
right? Your original inclusion criteria were not correct, or you don't have data to support what you wanted to check. Distri different distribution is okay. It's all a different distribution you can you can live with. The problem is is if there's no overlap, right? If there's no overlap of the distributions, then then you're in trouble, right? The fact that there's more that certain covariates are more likely to be treated or less likely to be treated. That's what the weight methods are for. That's what you the, the the good modeling should take care of that. If you go outside, you're extrapolating, right? You're you're extrapolating beyond anything you've ever seen, and. Um, there's no, there's no assumption that it would really work. So yeah, are there any other questions? If not, I can just run it through with, 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 with more friendly data. And uh, we'll see, this I have not done, so this is officially a live. Uh, so NHEFS, if you read the um, um, if you if you read uh, Hernan's book, what if he uses that data set a lot, right? Um, so from here, this this data has no <coughs> potential. This data has no potential outcomes. It's much smaller data. Um, here you see the that age is strongly correlated with this. This is data. This is the NH. Is, have you ever seen the NHFS data before? The NHFS stopping smoking data. NHFS is the. They did a study where they check. So ch I think the original study was was about smoking and mortality, but it's been repurposed in the causal inference world for smoking and weight loss. They check people's weight uh, ten years after stopping smoking to see whether smoking stopping smoking causes people's weight to go up or down. Um, they collected a handful of covariates. Uh, this data is is real data, um, right? So you see, there's very strong positive correlation between age and treatment assignment. People who are older are more likely to uh, to to stop smoking, and uh, negative correlation between age um, and the uh, the outcome, which is the uh, weight change, right? So more, I guess you'd say, more age is lower. Uh, weight, uh, yeah, as weight is more likely to be downward, weight change. Um, right, so you could do a, a marginal estimate and you get uh, uh, 2.54 is, the, is, is the, the weight difference uh, for, the, for the, 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 the weight change. Those who quit smoking, their weight went up by 2.54 kilograms compared to those who did not quit smoking without any adjustment. Okay, and here it's it's a little bit more uh, more normal looking. So here we can we can do an, an IPW estimate, and we can see what the graphs look like over here. Right here, we see the propensity is much more uh, friendly. Um, the the weighted after weighting the everything is very nicely balanced. Um, the evaluation metrics are, uh, are, are, I'd say, comparable to what we saw before. Here the calibration is a little bit better. It's, it's skewed, but it's a, it's a little bit better. Um, if we try the gradient boosting on the same thing, I've actually never tried this before. I don't know what's going to come out. Okay, so we see it does, it does not do as good a job of, uh, of, uh, of, of balancing, and the, uh, the calibration is a little different. This is tempting, in what I was thinking actually, because one is calibrated downwards and one is calibrated upwards, um, it's tempting to try and sort of combine them in some way, but I'm not sure exactly how you would do that. So um, we can Right, so we can maybe we'll just jump through to the end. So we can look here at the at the linear model. The linear model now looks much better than it did in the other case. Right, the gradient boosting model um, of the the outcome prediction actually looks a little bit looks a little worse than the linear model. It's kind of interesting. She looks a lot worse. Okay, 
and now, you know, so here there is no, here of course it's giving me an error here because there is no ground truth. Right. Uh, the ground truth is just not, sorry, I have to just delete this variable. Okay, so here, this, here, um, right, here we see it's kind of a similar picture to before. Again, the, the, almost all of the methods agree, and they make very similar sets of corrections uh, for the estimates. I'm not going to bother uh, to make the ground truth, this doesn't exist for this data. Um, Miha? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. But when we plotted the propensity distribution uh, up of the linear model, yeah, the it, it had positivity issues, no? There. Yeah, yeah, it does have some positive. This data does 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 have some positivity issues. Um, so we should solve that before jumping to the effects. Um, yeah, I mean, you would you you would have to it, in a in a realistic situation. Yeah, you would want to solve those. You would want to understand at least who are who are your positivity violations. What's uh, what's causing them? Um, can you can you realistically subset your population in a meaningful way? Because um, if you would just one of the one of the approaches that you can do is to just trim the the samples who are too high propensity or too low propensity, right? And then you no longer have a positivity problem. The that works, and we do that sometimes. The problem is, is that then the population for whom the effect is correct is not well defined mm -hmm. because you don't know who you, unless you can also characterize, right? Um, so the, ideally, you would have some sort of back and forth here where you would maybe trim the population, you set up some sort of new inclusion criteria, calculate the propensities, and then uh, calculate. Um, uh, Trim some and calculate a new one until you can converge at a, at a reasonable uh, state. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, right. So here, um, yeah, I think I'll just leave it at that. This is, uh, this is okay. So if there's not any, if there are any more, if there are not any more questions, then I guess we'll just uh, start the break a little earlier. No, we would like to have a quick discussion. But thank you very much. First, thanks. Okay.